Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is now the sixth episode of season five. I hope you all managed to check out my episode last week with my special guest Shay Doyle. Shay used to be an undercover cop and I must admit I have had some fantastic feedback about that episode. I have got a few more guest episodes lined up over the coming weeks, so please let me know what you do make of them. As always, before we get into this week's story, let's break the ice a little bit. The show's first opening icebreaker segment is this. Welcome to Daddy Facts. This week's Dad Fact is... To ensure a juicy steak, place it on a warmed tray after cooking and cover with foil. Let it rest for a few minutes to allow the meat to reabsorb the juices. Top tip, that's one I follow, I knew that. People think it's blood when a steak is rare and that it's bleeding. It's bollocks, of course. It's not blood. It's something else. Mitochondria, something like that. It's muscle juice. That's what we'll go with, muscle juice. (laughs) The second and final opening icebreaker segment of the show is this. The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku. Here is this week's haiku. Get out of my house. Zip, zing, black hole in the head. Wife, cowers in bed. It's a brutal one, isn't it? Jesus. A haiku is a Japanese poem made up of 17 syllables in three lines of five, seven, and five. It's meant to be read in one breath. There is a link to the Serial Killer's Book of Haiku 2 by Rose Bundy. That's where I get this season's haikus from in the episode description if you're interested in buying it. With my intro waffle complete, let's get into this week's episode. This case was suggested via Instagram DM by listener Philip Roberts. We're in the West Midlands County of Staffordshire this week. Specifically, our story takes place in the market town of Tamworth. Here are five quickfire facts about Tamworth. Did you know that the frequently lampooned Reliant Robin was produced by a Tamworth-based car manufacturer? The three-wheeled car was first manufactured in October 1973 by the Reliant Motor Company. Number two, Tamworth has six designated local nature reserves. Very nice. Number three, there is a breed of domestic pig named after the town. The Tamworth pig is also referred to as a sandyback or tam. Number four, Tamworth is said to have been the capital of the ancient kingdom of Mercia, an independent kingdom from 527 CE to 879 CE. And number five, Tamworth appears in the 2020 video game Assassin's Creed Valhalla as a Saxon fortress that the player can conquer. That fact is especially relevant to this week's story, and you'll see why in just a little bit. With a population of 81,964, according to the 2011 census, Tamworth is where the tragic yet bizarre events of this week's story took place. The villain this week is named Jake Notman, and I must admit, this is up there with some of the strangest cases I've ever researched. As you can see from the title, this episode is about a manslaughter case rather than a murder case but the story is still 100% worth telling. Themes this week include drug use and graphic depictions of violence. We're pretty much diving straight into the timeline of events this week, but before I do, let me firstly introduce Lauren May Bloomer. Born on June 22nd, 1995, Lauren had a bright future ahead of her. Opting to undertake a course at Nottingham University in her early to mid-twenties, Lauren was considered to be a mature student. That always tickles me when anyone at university over the age of 21 is considered to be mature, aka old. A bright young woman with an apparent Python-esque sense of humour, Lauren was a big fan of the arts, with photography in particular being one of the fields she excelled in. I tried my utmost to find out what course Lauren was taking at Nottingham, but none of my sources mentioned that piece of information. One would assume it would have been an art major or perhaps even photography. If anyone listening knows, please get in touch. As far as I can tell, Lauren had a great family around her and was raised well. 
It was only when Lauren met Tamworth local Jake Notman, a man two years her elder, that things took an unfortunate turn. Now in fairness, that statement could be easily misconstrued. This case is unusual in that the tragic events appear to have occurred completely out of the blue. It's not as if Jake was abusive to Lauren. I found no evidence to suggest that the pair had anything other than a loving relationship. They met in early 2020, after Jake and his long-term partner had separated. Lauren's love for video games was reciprocated by Jake, and the two hit it off immediately. Jake had landed a steady job at the Jaguar Land Rover car manufacturing factory, that's hard to say, in Solihull, West Midlands, seven years before meeting Lauren, and as 2020 neared its end, Jake and Lauren made the decision to live together. This meant Lauren would need to relocate around 35 miles southwest of Nottingham to Bingley Avenue in Tamworth. The pair didn't live together for long, however, as the launch of a highly anticipated new games console would bring an unexpectedly abrupt end to the couple's time in Tamworth. Who listening is a gamer? I used to be, but since becoming a father and doing a podcast, ain't nobody got time for that. If you are a gamer, then you've probably worked out which games console I'm referring to, the Sony PlayStation 5. After first being announced in April 2019, the £450 console was released in the UK and sold out immediately. Worse still, it's still sold out everywhere right now. Whenever new stock drops, it just instantly sells out. By some miracle, Jake and Lauren managed to get their hands on one of those prized consoles and decided to celebrate the momentous event by having a night dedicated to gaming. As a quick side note, some PS5 purchasers were shocked to find that their Amazon pre-orders of the console were not fulfilled. Instead, they were given products they never ordered, including coffee machines, foot massages, and cat food. Imagine how devastated you would be if you ordered the new PS5 and you got some Purina 1. You want to think of Joey, friends? Point to a bag today. So the epic night of gaming was all planned out. The console was bought and arrived safely at home, cat food free. The two games that came with it were primed and ready to entertain. You'll recall that Tamworth is a Saxon fortress you can conquer in 2020's Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Here's a link back to that fact. Along with Demon's Souls, Assassin's Creed Valhalla was one of the games Jake and Lauren would play on the evening of November 19th, 2020. Time for some snacks now. I'm not talking about Pringles and chocolate digestives here. Earlier that day, Jake had purchased a special brownie from one of his work colleagues. By special, I don't mean triple chocolate. Jake had purchased a weed brownie for the couple to share. Neither of them appear to have been strangers to the Class B drug, but they weren't regular smokers, they weren't Snoop Dogg. Jake would later go on to say he had never ingested marijuana in the form of a brownie before, and based on what happened next, he should have kept it that way. After playing on the PS5 for a little while in the lounge, Jake and Lauren decided to tuck into the laced brownie shortly before they went up to bed. Perhaps not understanding the strength of it, Jake may have bitten off more than he could chew for better use of a phrase. Now with edibles such as weed brownies, the psychoactive effects can kick in anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes after consumption, depending on their potency and the tolerance level of the user. When compared to the roughly 10 minutes it takes for the drug to kick in when smoking it, one can see how easy it can be for users to overindulge. It would be very easy to think that nothing is happening, with the temptation to take another bite becoming overwhelming. The downside, of course, is that the user can effectively consume more than their body and mind can handle. An old friend of mine actually overindulged once on a brownie whilst on a stag do in Amsterdam. He thought it would be a good idea to try his first ever brownie an hour before we flew home. He ate the entire thing. He was supposed to eat half, wait for a little while. <sighs> he ate the whole thing. It was a very uncomfortable journey home, I'll say that much. Who was sat next to him? Muggins here. This appears to have been the case with Jake Notman as well. He started having an extremely bad trip. Whilst in bed, 
he was becoming increasingly restless and behaving in a way that Lauren had never seen before. One source indicated that Jake had asked Lauren to slap him in an attempt to snap him out of it. Lauren even started looking for tips on how to reassure someone having a bad trip, with a phone record showing she did this shortly after 1am on Friday, November 20th, 2020. At 1.15am, Lauren's phone started a voice recording. It's unclear how and why the recording started, and nobody knows if Lauren pressed record intentionally due to fearing for her safety, or if she accidentally started recording. Either way, the horrific audio captured that morning would likely give whoever listened to it nightmares forevermore. Jake suddenly snapped and started violently attacking Lauren. He first tried to strangle Lauren with his bare hands in their bed, but she managed to convince him to stop and urged him to go downstairs to calm down. After following her boyfriend downstairs, Lauren was unaware that Jake had picked up a knife from the kitchen and was about to attack her with it. Jake repeatedly stabbed Lauren all over her body, continuing to do so as the terrified student ran out into the street pleading for help. The now deranged Jake continued his assault with the knife before heading back inside the house to retrieve the keys to his Ford Cougar. It's worth noting here that the crossover SUV weighs in excess of one and a half tons. As Jake made his way back outside and into the car, he started the ignition at what was now 1.24am and screamed, I am going to make sure you're dead. Jake then proceeded to run over Lauren's lifeless body with the car in what would later be described as a low-speed collision. Throughout that brutal chain of events, Lauren's phone continued recording from the upstairs bedroom. A few minutes later, Jake's uncle Craig arrived at the scene after having previously been contacted by a very worried Lauren. Craig was an ambulance technician, and Lauren had reached out to him to explain what had happened with the brownie and the bad trip, and that it would be ideal if he came over. During that phone call, Lauren can be heard attempting to reassure Jake by telling him she loved him, but in response, Jake replied, I will fucking murder you. Upon his arrival, Craig spotted Lauren laying prone in the street. He then rushed over and started administering CPR. Having been disturbed by the noise outside, some of Jake's neighbours woke up and called the police after seeing the devastation in the street. One neighbour said she was asleep, but the sheer amount of blue lights woke her up. The police had been called at 1.32am by Jake, who was now cowered in the fetal position inside the house. He told the operator that he required the police, as he had just killed his girlfriend. Shout out to all the police control room operators out there, by the way. There's no way on earth I'd be able to mentally cope with the demands of that job. The police arrived soon after, followed closely by the ambulance crew who arrived at 1.44am. Whilst the paramedics worked on trying to save Lauren, the police officers went inside the house. They found Jake Notman still in the fetal position upstairs with the lights off, talking gibberish and questioning his own existence. Miss Deborah Gould, a junior prosecutor for the Crown, would later say that, upon their arrival, the ambulance crew found Lauren being given CPR by Craig Notman, Jake's uncle. They swiftly took over, but by that time, it was all but too late. Lauren had gone into cardiac arrest, and the heartbreaking decision had to be made to stop any further treatment. Sadly, there was nothing anybody could do, and Lauren passed away there and then. A spokesperson for the West Midlands Ambulance Service said, We sent three ambulances, two paramedic officers, and the Merit Emergency Doctor and Critical Care Paramedic to the scene. On arrival, crews found a woman with life-threatening injuries and worked quickly to administer advanced trauma care to the patient. Sadly, despite best efforts, nothing could be done to save the woman and she was confirmed dead at the scene. A second patient, a man, was treated at the scene before being taken to hospital for further assessment. Jake was initially taken to hospital with minor injuries, before being remanded in police custody on suspicion of the murder of Lauren Bloomer. The officers on scene then conducted a thorough search of the house on Bingley Avenue. In the lounge, where the pair had set up shop to play their new PS5 all evening, the officers found candy brownies, chocolate biscuits, and two bags of green herbs. 
It didn't specify in any of the articles I read, but one would assume those were bags of weed intended to be smoked rather than ingested. Back at the station, Jake wasn't talking. The officers attempted to find out what had happened during five separate interviews, but Jake kept stum. Having said that, Jake did write a statement declaring his involvement in the morning's tragic and highly avoidable events. It read, I, Jake Notman, confirm the annotated following. I'd taken a weed brownie. It absolutely was my very first time actually ever ingesting marijuana in this manner. I had smoked them on three events only. Jake went on to allude that the brownie must have included more than simply marijuana in it to have the effect on him that it did. What he thought that extra ingredient was, only he knows. It was only after forensic pathologist Dr. Brett Lockyer conducted a post-mortem that the full extent of Lauren's injuries, as well as a cause of death, were revealed. Fair warning, this next part is especially graphic, it may be hard to hear. Lauren had been stabbed a total of 30 times all over her body by Jake. Some of the stab wounds were inflicted with such force that they penetrated Lauren's bones. There's no easy way to go through Dr. Lockyer's findings, so let's just start from the top and work our way down. One of Lauren's eyes had been cut across her eyelids, with the wound in question being 5 centimeters deep, causing severe damage to her orbital eye socket. Lauren had a cut on the side of her nose just under her left eyebrow that penetrated her nasal cavity. A 5.5 centimetre gash had occurred on Lauren's face extending from one of her eyes to her lips. Another facial injury was an 8.5 centimetre deep cut that penetrated Lauren's mouth, gums and teeth. She was then stabbed viciously in the back by Jake. An 8 centimetre deep cut was present on the right side of her upper back that caused damage to the inner fibres of her shoulders and back. A 6.5 centimetre deep cut was present on the left side of her back. That one also caused muscle tissue damage in the middle of Lauren's back and caused her to inhale blood into her lungs. The blow that is thought to have been the fatal one was a 16 centimetre deep wound in Lauren's chest that punctured one of her lungs along with the respective pulmonary artery. On top of all those horrific injuries, Lauren's hands displayed signs that she attempted to defend herself from the onslaught. A 3.5 cm cut was found on one of Lauren's palms with a 7 cm cut found on the other. Dr. Lockyer suggested that Lauren was likely trying to grab the knife away from Jake whilst at the same time attempting to prevent herself from being stabbed with it. The entire melee only lasted about 2.5 minutes. It's also thought that Lauren realistically passed away before Jake entered the Ford Cougar. Due to his mental state, Jake was taken to a medical facility to be assessed and observed. It seems as though his bad trip didn't last too long, and within a few hours, he felt like his normal self again, or as normal as he could in that situation. It's worth pointing out now that Jake had never had any involvement with the police prior to this incident, and he had no history of mental illness. He wasn't on any medication, he didn't have a therapist, he didn't have depression or suicidal thoughts. The only thing said to have led to this incident was the weed brownie. Three psychiatrists produced reports in relation to how and why such a small volume of marijuana had such a catastrophic effect on Jake's mind that it led him to do what he did. Not one of the psychiatrists said that they had ever seen such a reaction to the drug. There are no prior case studies to suggest this was even possible, but clearly, depending on which side of the argument you sit on, it is. At the very least, it could be. Regardless of the cause, the psychiatrists all agreed that Jake was in the midst of a psychotic episode during the attack, and therefore was not of sound mind at the time. He had diminished responsibility. They said the distortion of his own reality was such that he didn't have the mental capacity to actively decide to harm or kill Lauren in that moment. What do you make of that, dear listener? It sounds outrageous to think that such a psychotic episode could be caused by an edible. Having said that, I'm obviously not a doctor, and what happened, happened. Jake's trial commenced on November 17th, 2021, with his initial charge being the murder of Lauren Bloomer. 
Jake's defence attorney, Andrew Fisher QC, explained to the jury that his client was going through an extreme and flowery psychiatric episode during the attack in which he was completely disconnected from reality and went completely delusional. Crown attorney Ben Douglas Jones backed up this claim by confirming what the three psychiatrists who looked at the case had agreed. He said, All three experts agree that the defendant's psychiatric response to cannabis, based on the evidence, including the record, was so profound that he could not see what was real and what was not. Specifically, he couldn't tell if Lauren Bloomer was alive or dead, real or not. In other words, he couldn't tell if she was with someone else or not. The Crown reviewed the high-level evidence within the CPS and, after careful consideration, determined that the murder charges could not be prosecuted. Jake subsequently pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced on that basis. Mrs Justice May said the following during Jake's sentencing at Stafford Crown Court on November 24th, 2021. The sentence for the offence of unlawful act manslaughter is one of eight years and eight months imprisonment. You will be released from custody no later than two-thirds of the way through the sentence, namely five years and nine months, and the remainder of the sentence will be served on licence in the community. You must comply with all the conditions of your licence, failing which you will be at risk of recall to prison to serve the remainder of the term in custody. The time you have already served on remand will be taken into account automatically. Judge May concluded that it would have been unreasonable to have expected Jake to enter his guilty plea to unlawful manslaughter any sooner than he did, so he is therefore entitled to the full one-third sentence reduction for his plea. Lauren's mum then made a heartbreaking victim impact statement. She said, The horror of hearing you scream for help replays over and over in my mind. I feel physically sick thinking of the pain and terror you must have felt while you fought and pleaded for your life as he knelt over you screaming obscenities. Lauren was our world. She was the cement that held us together. The guiding voice of excitement with Halloween and Christmas. A truly talented artist and creator of pranks and all-round fun. Her laugh was so loud and contagious. The colours have truly drained from our world. I feel I need to be strong for so many people. Well, all I really want to do is curl up in a ball and cry, but I'm frightened I'll never stop or get up again. Every day doing nothing is exhausting, and I feel so ashamed that I'm not able to get back to some normality. My sources indicate that Jake Notman will be eligible for release on licence on November 23rd, 2025, two-thirds of the way into his sentence. Before closing off this story, I'd like to mention an interesting rebuttal I came across whilst conducting my research. It's from Green Queen magazine, a team of objective news writers, creatives and investigators who provide cannabis media celebrating the hemp and cannabis industries. In an article titled, A Rebuttal to the Notman Case, Cannabis is Not Illegal for Good Reason, Author Jake Ramage contends that Judge May's declaration that cannabis can be very dangerous and is an illegal drug for good reason is wrong. Jake argues that whilst Green Queen believe the sentencing is justified, the judge's conclusion on cannabis is negligent and fails to address the issue at hand. The reductive line that cannabis triggered a mental illness out of the blue is claimed to do everybody a disservice. For the record, Jake does explicitly mention that the magazine's thoughts are first and foremost with Lauren's family and anyone affected by this horrible event. And that was the story of British killer Jake Notman. Thanks again to Philip Roberts for suggesting that case. I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on it. Do you believe the weed-induced psychotic episode reasoning? Should this have been a murder sentence instead of manslaughter? Let me know in the YouTube comments or via social media. I've got six new reviews to read out this week, so please bear with me. Thank you, firstly, Apple Podcast user Sarkins2 for leaving British Murders a five-star rating and review. They said, I love this podcast. There's no waffle. The crimes are delivered in exactly the right way. I look forward to each release. Thank you, Apple Podcast users Pam and Phil for leaving British Murders a five-star rating and review. They said, we chuffin' love you, Mr. Blues. 
really into this podcast and totally entertaining and sinister. Keep it coming. Thank you, Rachel Jones, for recommending British Murders on Facebook. Rachel said, love this podcast. Easy to listen to, funny, thoughtful, insightful, interesting. Love Stu's accent, wit and laughs. Great to binge on. I am so glad I found you. Hooked. Love your work all the way from Australia. Good eye, Mike. Thank you, James Popplestone, for recommending British Murders on Facebook. James said, very well researched and entertaining podcast. His voice, although northern, isn't too annoying. Five stars. <laughs> Cheers, James. Thank you, Irene Garrett, for recommending British Murders on Facebook. Irene said, easy to listen to and gets to the point without all the boring stuff. And finally, thank you, Ben from Norwich, for leaving British Murders a five-star rating and review on BritishMurders.com. Ben said, this podcast has kept me locked in from day one. As I work 12-hour shifts day and night, no matter what time of day or night it is, this keeps me entertained. And just for the record, love this bit, just for the record, <laughs> that American Wally with the review, ignore him. The absolute twonk doesn't know what he's going on about. Keep up the great work. Ben's words, not mine. <laughs> I appreciate the backup though, Ben. And cheers for the other reviews, Sarkins 2, Pam and Phil, Rachel, James and Irene. Suppose you'd like to leave a review of the show and have it read on a future episode. You can do so on iTunes, Podchaser or by visiting BritishMurders.com. You can also leave star ratings on Spotify. You can even leave me voicemails now on BritishMurders.com. That's exactly what Charlie did. And here is that message. Hi, mate. Um, I absolutely love all of your content. I love your voice, to be honest. It's really soothing. Cheers, Charlie. Great, that, isn't it? Feel free to send me some voicemails and I'll play them on future episodes. Why not? You can become a Patreon member if you like, you can gain early access to ad-free episodes, or you can donate on a one-off basis via Buy Me A Coffee. Links to both of those are on my website. And please continue sending your case suggestions to BritishMurdersPodcast at gmail.com or message me via social media. You'll not only get the episode covered, but you'll also get a cheeky shout-out as well. Before I go, I just want to let you know about a couple of podcasts I've been on as a guest recently. I made my fifth appearance on my buddy Robbie Robertson's podcast called Out of the Blank. Episode 1039 is my most recent appearance. I also appeared on Zevan Odelberg's podcast called Kinda Murdery. I'm on season two, episode 23 for that one. I had a blast on both shows and I've linked the episodes below. So please check them out and show the boys some support for me. Next week, I'm back with another guest episode. I'll be welcoming Dr. Amanda Brown to the show to discuss her career as a prison doctor. It's a belter, you don't want to miss that one. But I'm done rambling on now. That is it for now, I promise. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.